much, Josh. Um, so, my name is Jessica Bryan. I'm a senior archaeologist uh, with MOLA. Um, basically, my job just is um, a supervisor, archaeological supervisor, on commercial excavations, um, mainly in London, but also a bit outside of London. Um, and my talk today is basically about our work that we've been doing uh, with Tideway. Um, the title of my talk is uh, not just a reference to my love of 80s rock music, um, but it's also about the kind of environment that we have been working in and the kind of, as I think it was um, Helen said earlier, about the kind of, the fact that the foreshore isn't that easy to work on. It's slippy, it's, it's muddy, it's wet, but it's very, rewar very rewarding. Um, so my talk's going to kind of be in two halves. I'm going to kind of outline what MOLA's been doing um, and the work we've been doing with Tideway kind of in general. And then I'm going to focus on one of our foreshore sites that we've been working on uh, down in Putney. Um, we've already covered kind of some of the stuff that's around Putney, um, Putney area. Um, so I'll show you kind of some of the work that Tideway's been doing down on the foreshore. Some of you may have seen it. You may have been uh, kind of down walking past seeing the works. So hopefully this will kind of explain kind of a bit more about what, what's been happening down there. So, um, just uh, I'm not sure how many of you are aware of, about Tideway and what it is, so I'm just going to kind of give you a quick recap. There's a bunch of interesting facts on the board there, feel free to read at your own leisure. But broadly speaking, Tideway is going to be a new super sewer that's going to be running underneath the Thames. Um, it's going to be about 65 metres below ground level, uh, it's about 25 kilometres long. Um, and the idea is that this solves the problem um, of the overflowing Victorian sewers that we have now. Uh, the current sewer system was built in about 1860 and it can no longer cope with the amount of sewage um, that's being generated by the population of London. And the idea is that not only is the new sewer going to be something that's usable for, the, uh, for quite a foreseeable future, but also it's going to clean up the Thames. It's going to make the foreshore a much more kind of pleasant and accessible place. And, I mean, if any of you have been down to Putney, you'll know it can get pretty gross down there at some times. Um, so, what does the construction of the Tideway Tunnel involve, um, and what will the works involve? There are 24 sites along the route. Um, these are a combination of above-ground works and below-ground works. There are three main tunnel drive sites. So these are the three big three sites. Uh, that's Carnworth Road in, in the west, Kirtling Street, and Chambers Wharf in the east. Um, and this is where the excavation of three kind of large, up to 30 metre in diameter shafts um, are going to be excavated. And these are the kind of the main, their main construction sites and where they're setting up their main um, kind of welfare and things like that. And if any of you have kind of been around those areas, particularly around Chambers Wharf, you probably would have seen these sites kind of growing um, existentially in the past kind of 18 months or so. Other sites along the route, um, there's kind of um, so, some smaller sites where there's going to be access shafts, there'll be maintenance shafts going in, there's sewer improvement works to the current sewer system, um, and then there's a lot of connection um, tunnels that are going in. So um, out in Greenwich, there's connections to the pumping station out there, and things like that. So there's kind of a big combination of work um, that's going on. Now, all of these sites um, have been subject to environmental assessments, and in those environmental assessments is archaeology and heritage. Um, all of the sites have had uh, heritage assessments carried out, or desk-based assessments, um, and these were carried out by Tideway. Um, and these assessments were informed by a combination of evaluation work that MOLA carried out, um, but also, in terms of the foreshore sites, it's basically all the TDP data that's been collected by the frogs over the years. That's the things that have been feeding into these kind of historic assessments that Tideway have been working with. So, how does MOLA fit into this big project? Um, Tideway have their timeline starting in 2014. However, MOLA was involved quite a few years before that. Uh, we've been on site since 2013. Uh, we have been doing a lot of uh, initial watching briefs in those first few years. Uh, a lot of that was on geotechnical work, so they needed to find out what soil was below the ground, um, if there was anything below the ground that they weren't, they weren't aware of. So these kind of site, initial site investigations, we did a lot of watching briefs on those. So that just involved us going and monitoring small-scale kind of uh, test pit excavations. Um, in 2014, the Tideway project started officially, and the sites were started to be established. So 2014, 2015, 2016 uh, was where our kind of 
main work began. Um, we started with the excavation of evaluation trenches. So these were at the main big drive shaft sites, but also a number of the smaller sites along the route as well. Um, we did a number of foreshore walkover surveys. Um, so a lot of the TDP data that was available, we needed to go and check how valid that was. Were things still there? What condition they were in? Um, the kind of work that you guys do, or a lot of you do anyway, but it needed to be put into a formal report so that Tideway had access to that data. Um, and we also did a lot of watching booths on the site set at works. Um, as I say, if you've been past any of these main sites, um, you'll see the kind of huge... Um, a welfare and office blocks that have gone up, temporary office blocks for, the, for man managing the work, and we did a lot of the kind of monitoring on the groundworks for those. Um, and then kind of starting from this year really and onwards, we've been doing the main excavations. Um, so these are land-based excavations mainly. Uh, we've got some very big sites that are happening at the moment. We've got some smaller sites, um, all equally as interesting and all providing kind of different insights into uh, the archaeology along the route. Um, and this is both kind of on the river banks and also there are some kind of more land-bound sites as well. Um, and included in the work, we're still doing things like watching briefs and enabling works. Um, there's a lot of foreshore work that's uh, beginning this year, so we're doing a lot of watching briefs on the excavations that are happening. Um, and then kind of going on from this year um, and going forward, the project doesn't finish until 2023, we'll obviously still be monitoring and doing excavations, but it will feed into kind of research and reporting about what has been found. So it's kind of how, you know, how we're going to make this information available to the public. So Josh kind of touched on the heritage interpretation strategy a little bit in his talk. Um, I'm just kind of going to fill you in a little bit about it. So this is how we are going to kind of view the sites. It gives us an aim and a focus for our work. Rather than just going out and collecting a lot of data um, and then publishing it in what, unfortunately, can often be quite dull grey literature reports, um, the aim is that Tideway will kind of synthesise the information coming from their sites and have like a plan of how they're going to present it to the public. Um, so this is why they came up with their heritage interpretation strategy. Um, and the strategy has like a principal theme, uh, River of Liberty. And this principal theme then has three what they call regional cultural narratives underneath. And each section of the Tideway route has its own uh, cultural narrative. So in the western section of site, um, they're talking about the society in transition. So this is how society along the banks of the Thames has come from more of a kind of recreational uh, landed gentry type kind of focus into a more industrial type of focus in the 19th century. In the central area, they're talking about civic London. So this is more about the urban development of London in the 19th century and the kind of environmental deterioration of the Thames that results from that population increase. And then in the east, they focus on what they call the gateway to the world. Um, so this is the progression of the uh, um, inhabitants along the banks of the Thames in the east from rural farming communities into these large global dockyards and maritime trade trading centres, um, you know, places like Deptford and, you know, things like that, developing from kind of rural communities into these big urban kind of centres. Um, as I mentioned before, all of the sites have um, been subject to a kind of like a, a, an initial assessment and all of them um, have some work on site that is being monitored by us. And all of that will feed into this big um, heritage interpretation strategy. Um, currently, we are working on about five or six of these sites. Um, we have probably had presence at all of these sites at some time in the past year and will have presence in the, next, in the coming years. Um, we've, got a, say we've got a couple of bigger um, excavations going on at the moment on some of the central, uh, east and western sites. Um, but... I'm just going to kind of focus on one of them, um, which is in the West and Putney Embankment. Uh, we've kind of touched on Putney before, lovely kind of rural setting. I have to say, it's probably one of the worst jobs I've ever had. <laughs> Terrible setting, and we face some absolutely awful logistical issues. <laughs> But in all seriousness, what have we been doing at Putney? So we first started work in 2016, um, kind of doing some monitoring work. There are two main areas of site at Putney. So this is the Putney Foreshore, Putney Bridge on the right-hand side of the screen there. 
The main site is the site that kind of encompasses the area of Putney Bridge. Um, this is the main excavation works. They're going to be putting in a new sewer um, overflow kind of capture system. At the moment, uh, as anyone's been down there, you'll know that there is a storm overflow drain that basically pumps out sewage onto the foreshore at quite regular intervals. Um, and the idea is that, that will, the new kind of capture system will reduce that down to a maximum once a year, which will make this whole place a, love, a better environment to be in. So this kind of main site will involve uh, excavation of a shaft, excavation of an uh, underground excavation of a tunnel, um, and the installation of new structures. Um, because this site of where it's situated, because of where the site, main site is situated, they're going to have to close off uh, the main slipway that runs down next to Putney Bridge. As such, they established a secondary site, uh, which is where they, well, they have installed a temporary slipway that can be used by the public while the main works is going on. Now, all of these works uh, have the potential to impact on archaeology, known archaeology that was down there. So in the summer of 2016, we began uh, with doing a walkover sur uh, survey of the heritage assets or the archaeology that was visible on the foreshore. Um, so what we did is we took all the data that was available from the TV TDP, but also from a, a walkover survey that had been done by Wessex Archaeology in 2011, and we went out onto site. And our aim was to identify the heritage assets that had been recorded before, confirm their location, check their condition, um, also to see if anything had moved, anything uh, was no longer there, but also to record any new assets that, uh, that had appeared. So everything that we recorded, we recorded using uh, standard molar um, systems, standard molar context sheets, um, and we also plotted it using GPS. Uh, the plan of the GPS plots was then uh, produced, and this has then fed into the scheme of works. So all of this happened before any of the design for the works went ahead, because Tideray needed to know where the assets were on the foreshore. The kind of things that we found there, um, you, uh, to be honest, you're all probably more familiar with them, or most of you are more familiar than with them than with them I am. But it's things like uh, timber stakes, timber posts, there was a timber slipway, and there's a number of uh, chalk barge beds and slipways out there as well. Most of that was thought to be post-medieval um, and all just on the surface and visible, kind of with no excavation. Uh, part of our work as well, um, we did some built heritage recording. So at MOLA we have a what we call a standing buildings team, and they're the, the guys that go out and record historic buildings. Um, and as part of the, um, the river wall was going to be, um, well, not necessarily demolished, that's too strong a word, but altered, um, we needed to capture a kind of record of this, the current river wall that's there. And so they went out and actually made this 3D model. Unfortunately, mine doesn't float around like Helen's did because I didn't manage to download it. But it, it's, it's, quite a good, it's quite a good representation of the, um, of the river wall. If you look on the kind of um, your right of the screen, left of the screen, you can see the two birdcage type things. Um, for those of you that are not familiar, that is the, uh, the kind of the outflow for the sewage um, that comes out into the Thames. It's pretty disgusting in front of there at times. As I say, it kind of discharges 33 times a year into the Thames. And that's the area that's going to be, uh, that have the main works, basically. They're going to be replacing those kind of birdcage structures with a more effective system that's going to filter uh, the sewage down into the tunnel that will be running under the Thames. So, um, what else do we do? In terms of construction work, we began in November of 2016. So this is after our initial walkover survey and after we've informed Tideway of all the known asset, assets on the site. So basically, we mon monitored uh, different, all different kinds of work. Um, and if any of you have been down there, you may have seen some of these things going on. Um, whenever there was any excavation on the foreshore, uh, a MOLA senior archaeologist was present and we were all, at all times advising the work uh, to make sure that no heritage was kind of damaged. So the kind of different works that we monitored, so there's a UXO um, investigations. That cool looking machine on the, on the top there basically has got a probe that comes out the bottom. Um, it basically sends a signal into the ground to see if there's any UXO and exploded ordnance in the ground. Uh, we did monitoring of pontoon installations. Uh, we did monitoring of enabling works for the site, uh, which required excavation. And we also did monitoring of site um, investigation. 
Uh, believe it or not, we don't act, or Tideway didn't actually know how the river wall was built. They needed to find that out, so they had to dig a series of holes along the foundations and footings of the river wall to actually establish what they looked like. Um, so we monitored kind of all of these excavations and recorded all the findings. Um, all of this work was designed to avoid any known heritage assets. Um, and we also monitored the plant movement. Um, you, if you see a big excavator driving along, you obviously know that it, the tracks can actually kind of churn up the ground quite a lot. Um, so we were there to make sure that that didn't disturb any timbers on the ground. And any time that the machine needed to drive over anything, we were there to make sure that there was the installation of things like steel plates on the ground so the timbers were preserved. Um, kind of a lot like the Elliot was describing earlier of trying to preserve those upright stakes. We were basically monitoring so that they didn't get kind of destroyed. Um, and obviously there are a lot of assets that we didn't know about that were underground. And I'll kind of come on to those in a, in a minute. So, as I mentioned before, there were kind of two main sites, and so this is uh, the installation and excavation uh, for the temporary slipway. So, the temporary slipway itself uh, involved ground reduction, um, which you can see in the top photo there, and the installation of steel piles um, so that they could actually pour the concrete slipway. And as I say, all of this work um, was archaeologically monitored so that we could make sure that everything was maintained um, as best that we could. So what did we find? Um, so obviously the stuff on the surface was protected, but the stuff underneath the ground we weren't, you know, we didn't really know it was there. Some of the holes that were excavated were up to three metres deep. Um, so we managed to see things like earlier foreshore horizons. Uh, we managed to get down to London clay. We managed to see some buried, buried organic horizons as well in some of the holes, which was quite nice. Um, we uncovered a lot of large timbers that were probably associated with the construction of uh, the, cur the current river wall and the slipways. So the large timber that you see there is a big oak pile. It's about three metres long. It's got an iron shoe on the uh, point of it, so uh, kind of an iron cap, so that it can be driven into the ground easier. Um, and we think that this is probably 19th century, um, and is probably part of the enabling works for them to construct the river wall and the slipways. So a lot like we've been monitoring the works, the enabling works on the site, in the 19th century they would have had similar enabling works to kind of stabilise the ground and for temporary structures so that they could actually construct the river wall and the slipways. Um, we also kind of during the excavations, as I mentioned, found kind of buried, buried organic horizons. And the photo in the top there with the trowel, um, unfortunately it's not really that clear so it's very difficult to kind of photograph peat um, but there was a thin kind of organic horizon about half a metre below ground level and within that organic horizon, horizon uh, were a series of kind of wooden stakes that were driven in um, these stakes were taken away um, for sampling and we will use them for further analysis and dating uh, later on in the project um, and it's possible that these states could be prehistoric. It's possible that they could be medieval. We're not really sure at the moment. But the likelihood is, is there were probably something maybe for a small boat mooring or um, a small revetment, maybe even a fish trap, um, something like that. Um, we also found kind of on the foreshore um, architectural fragments of stone. So you see the bottom photo there. We think that they may have come um, from the adjacent church, St Mary's Church. Um, so there were kind of bits and pieces like that that were washing up that we weren't always aware of. Um, some of the work, some of the UXO um, investigations had to follow a certain line. And obviously UXO investigation is very important. We don't want to hear a bomb or anything like that. So some of, the, some of the paths for UXO were actually going to go over large areas of uh, heritage assets. So the photo you see on the screen here is a, um, what was initially identified as a barge bed, but it's actually probably um, more likely a stone and chalk slipway. Um, and because this had the potential to be disturbed, what we did was we excavated the whole, the foreshore gravels off the top of it and uncovered the whole area. Initially, during our walkover survey, this was identified as two separate kind of um, contexts, two separate features, but it actually turned out that this is a, a large 27-metre um, slipway. Um, it's kind of hard-standing chalk and stone, um, and it's possibly that this might be a, a ferry point or something similar um, that would have been used for crossing the Thames prior to a bridge construction. Um, and in fact, if you stand on the bank of the Thames, so this is on the... Um, 
next to, directly next to Putney Bridge. That photo is taken from Putney Bridge. And if you stand and look directly opposite on the Fulham side, there's another one of these that you can spot at low tide. So it looks like there possibly would have been some kind of ferry crossing across the river. But um, So we kind of collected all this information um, and now we're looking at how that can like, help us understand the development of Putney and how this all fits into kind of that interpretation, heritage interpretation scheme that Tideway uh, have implemented. Um, so as I said, this is about the kind of the development of the area um, from a kind of um, recreational area into a more urban kind of area. So basically, you, when you've seen from the, uh, the timbers and things like that, you, we can tell things about the construction of the river wall, about the constructions of the slipways in the 19th centuries. Um, the, the presence of that chalk uh, potential kind of ferry launch is quite interesting because it could be a precursor um, to the bridges. Um, if you look at Rope's map at the top there, you'll see the original um, 18th century bridge that uh, connected Putney and Fulham. Um, and then this was replaced in the 19th century by the, the current bridge that is there today. Um, but it might be that this ferry point port, uh, the ferry crossing, was there before either of these bridges and kind of can tell us about the use of the river um, in the kind of earlier 18th century. Although, as Elliot pointed out earlier, it's very difficult to date these things and we have no dating evidence from that, that chalk uh, ferry launch. Um, but I think these, the two maps kind of show the kind of nice development of the area and the fact that the stuff that we're finding in the ground is actually supporting this idea of kind of a more urbanised more urbanised environment. So, the future work at Putney then. Um, as I said, this is going to be uh, an excavation site where they're going to be building a new kind of sewer um, outflow and connection into the, tu into the tunnel. Um, the construction of the shaft uh, will involve excavation and piling, um, and it's going to take about probably three and a half years to complete that excavation. And at all time, we will be on site monitoring all of those works so that any future heritage assets um, can be recorded. And obviously, we'll be there taking some nice photos as well. Thank you very much.